Hello, my name is Andrew Collins and I'm a telly addict. If you don't have Sky Atlantic, this is what you're missing. Wars not won. Brand new Game of Thrones starts April the 7th on Sky Atlantic HD. The Game of Thrones trailer on a constant loop. I've actually seen the first episode of season four, but my lips are sealed. You'll have to wait until 2 a.m. on Monday the 7th. In the meantime, if you want blood, guts, pain, and scenes of a sexual nature. No, of course I don't have any towels. I'm in a taxi. A taxi. Oh, the head's out. I can see the head. Oh, God, this is ghastly. A comedy known for its gentle, unhurried, calming, restful, slow-paced style, Rev, which returned for its third series on BBC Two, started as one assumes it doesn't mean to carry on, with Vicar's wife Olivia Colman staging her own nativity for Simon McBurney's Archdeacon. Uh, well, whatever it is, it's got hair on it. Oh, no, 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 I'm not going to make the hospital! No! No, 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 no! The scene in the car at the beginning of Reservoir Dogs was a relaxing bath by comparison. So then, to sink C of E priest Adam Smallbone, played with a permanent air of bare typically befuddled Anglican calm by Tom Hollander, a baby daughter. It's quite nice, isn't it? It's such a relief to have Rev back. It's the sitcom you can watch from one end to the other in happy monastic silence. You're more likely to go, ah, than laugh your socks off, but that's absolutely fine. I'd forgotten about your sense of humour, Yusuf. <laughs> the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says that humour is good, so long as it is used in moderation. It should be used like salt on a mule. I'll tell my wife, Alex, she can hire your fitness guy as long as she wears a burqa during her workout. <laughs> See, that is too much humour now. For a Muslim, that's not acceptable. Right. Having brilliantly established the show's dwindling flock, come Series 2, arch writer James Wood had the confidence just to let us eavesdrop on the daily life at St Saviour's. In 3, there's room for some new characters. Kayvan Novak's double bluffing Imam. You know, children of the future. Yes. Who said that? Um, did you say it? Someone black, famous, and profound? Uh, Nelson Mandela. It was Whitney Houston. <laughs> <laughs> and two busybodies from the diocese, Joanna Scanlon and Vicky Pepperdine, who bring a flavour of getting on, the thick of it, and W1A to proceedings. Very difficult area. Yes. But it's my job, as the new area dean, to ask what is the best way to be church here. Yes, how should we be church here? Mm. I'd like to do some pastoral reorganisation. It's too long to show in full, but I particularly liked this tour de force, Adam's explanation of church hierarchy. Then there are the cathedral deans who run the cathedrals, canons or prebendaries as senior priests within the cathedrals, then there are the archdeacons. He's mine, he runs several deaneries within each archdeaconry, and then there are the area deans, she's one, and then finally there are the priests. Called vicars, or sometimes rectors, depending on how their tithes were historically paid, but it's a side issue, really. I'm sure there are non believers out there, but I remain faithful. Like the show itself, The Devout, and there are about a million and a half of us, don't feel the need to make a song and dance about it. Is that too much humour again? Nice nod to multiculturalism there. Enjoy it while you can. Multiculturalism was tremendously powerful for a, a good two or three decades, I would say. It is probably weaker now than it used to be because um, it's, it's a luxury, that ideology. It's what you do when you have uh, money in the bank. This was a party political broadcast on behalf of the English Defensiveness League, given by the novelist Martin Amis on BBC Four, which really did start out as a relaxing bath. Seagulls Ascending, the first of many yards of library footage deployed to colour in what resembled a curiously flat and dispassionate nostalgia show, with only one talking head on it. I remember doing a quiz in the Daily Mail, which was, how posh are you? And it was, what do you call it, lavatory or toilet or WC, you know, lavatory, couch, settee or sofa, sofa. It wasn't entirely clear why Amos was even giving this lengthy interview on the subject of Englishness and class, but even though I bailed out of his once rip-roaring novels, Circa Time's Arrow, I remained partial to his non-fiction and hopped aboard. Coburn Special Reserve. We'd be letting ourselves down if we didn't talk about English drunkenness, which has no equivalent in, in Southern Europe, certainly. Um, it's not considered amusing in France or Italy to be drunk. But if you go out on any night in any city in England, 
there are people in utter disarray with drink. From the ideal vantage point of his and his American wife's home in New York, Amos assessed this septic aisle in a distorting rearview mirror. It's this sort of fr feeding frenzy of drink that you see in every city every night in England. You know, they drink to forget, forget their glorious past, reconcile themselves with a the reduced present. Uh, it's, um, it's drowning their sorrows, not not, it's not celebratory. Wrong. To dismiss England's world-class binge drinking as something devoid of pleasure or social cohesion merely exposes Amos as the Victor Meldrew of the intelligentsia. But the clue to this programme's otherness lay in the end credits. It was French. Made by a French production company for a French-German TV channel with the support of the Centre National de la Cinéma et de l'Image l'Anime and based on an idea by a Swiss academic based in Paris, which is presumably why nobody noticed how antiquated his views were. On the plus side, bravo to Anglo-French director Marc Cadell, who did a lot of the heavy lifting by artfully assembling the dichotomous archive and music. We shall fight on the landing ground. Who else remembers post-Big Audio Dynamite outfit Dread Zone and their 1996 hit Little Britain? Not Martin Amis. Right, let's spool back to an England that he'd more readily recognise. Sometime in about 1507, Torrigiano fetched up in what was reported to be Europe's most philistine backwater. A grubby, dirty, uninspiring little place at the end of the known world. England. I love the early 16th century, and so does TV's youngest art historian, Dr James Fox, whose latest vehicle, A Very British Renaissance on BBC Two, will not have won in many votes with UKIP. And this episode is about how it all got started. How a handful of brilliant European artists brought the new ideas of the Renaissance to Britain. How we learned from their techniques, experimented with their ideas, and through them began to develop a voice of our own. Having led us through approachable appreciations of the British masters and the importance of colour, the fantastic Dr Fox gives us yet more to ponder in his skinny tie. He's an animated Kenneth Clark who genuflects to a lot of the same art. Such as Torrigiano's Fancy Pants Henry VII tomb in Westminster Abbey. It's a revolutionary piece of work, and I think it's revolutionary for two reasons. I always appreciate an enthusiastic tour guide, especially one who's prepared to park his own objectivity and use the phrase, I think. Holbein's drawings are the first really lifelike faces in the whole of British history. And they mark the beginning of a major British tradition, a warts and all preference for reality over beauty that has persisted ever since. But I think... An illuminating slice of geocultural history with a thesis that essentially celebrates immigration. What more could you ask? Well, having rumbled Dr Fox's allusions to the sleeve of Bob Dylan's freewheeling album in his last series, he makes good on that promise in this one, in a cheeky revision of subterranean homesick blues for Thomas Tallis's choral classic Spem in Allium. Get thee to iPlayer for the full rendition and the next two parts. We leave these shores all together now for another ingratiating but quizzical look at America. Louis Theroux, raised in London but with his travel writer dad's insatiable yearning for passport stamps, recently copied Martin Amis' response to the question, if you like America so much, why don't you go and live there? LA is well known for its population of pampered pooches, but its high crime areas are home to a community of street dogs, neglected and sometimes aggressive. In the first of this latest three-part series for BBC Two, Louis roams the perfect intersection between two intrinsically entertaining sets, people who live in LA, like him, and people who have pets. What's your name? Greg. Greg. Retired fireman. When you thought about her being sad and her being given up by her old family, that, that, that upset you, didn't it? Sure, you know, we all have personal issues in our life that we're dealing with. You know, from the past, <laughs> this guy's like digging, digging, digging. Well I, well, I got abandoned when I was a child. My dad left when I was 13, gone, boom, forever. 
So there's abandonment issues. Louis has made a career out of squinting, looking slightly askance and disguising journalistic rigour as social befuddlement, and it gets results. We've been very open about the fact that animals do get euthanized here fairly regularly in, in, in quite high numbers. We never do more than like 10 or 12 in one day. Basically the dog is standing there looking like this and all of a sudden it just kind of goes like that. But while the root of LA's surplus dog problem is people with no respect for animals, this programme focused on people with the utmost respect, like Leslie at the Dog Pound, Greg the foster owner, and Brandon, a Zen dog whisperer, who also gets results. Here's a problem pooch called Burger before. And here he is meeting Brandon for the very first time. I'm just being assertive. I'm not being, I'm not making him fight for his life. I'm not trying to dominate him. I'm just doing what I want to do as a leader. It's animal magic. A quick recommendation for another Welsh language thriller from S4C after last year's Agwech, which is available for UK residents to view on the channel's website with subtitles. 35 Days, or in the rather more lyrical local tongue, Tree Deg Pimp Dur Nod, is a high concept existential Welsh brookside. Written by Sue Ann Jones and William Owen Roberts, it starts with a dead body at the end of a gated Caerphilly cul de sac, and then plays this card. Nice early nod to The Shining there. Our job is to guess which of the horrible, curtain-twitching middle-class residents might have done it. The creepy piano-playing prison officer with the bandaged hand. The distant, separated husband whose daughter really likes jigsaws. Or the old geezer with the computer in the shed. At the end of the day, it gets very dark. I read last week how the influence of Scandinavian drama has even reached the dreaming spires of Morse prequel Endeavour, returning to ITV next week. So why not Welsh drama? The language even sounds a bit Nordic. Condescending bitch. Well, some of it. Your moment of zen this week comes from Stuart Lee's comedy vehicle, some old-fashioned clowning that reduces fellow comic Jimmy Carr's technique to a single wordless gesture. When you've said it, at the end, you just go... <laughs>